How's everybody out there? We're going to have some fun here at the Senior Center. It's called the Sunshine Club, I think. So Farmer Nick is here, and he's going to put on an expose on how to inoculate shiitake mushrooms. Logs, so. Oh, yes. Yeah. Have good fun. I want to say hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. We're from uh, Douglas Orchard and Farm, which I think you probably by now, hopefully in the last three years, heard of us. We are the new owners, as of three years ago, of the old Wormy Place down on Locust Street, which is off the beaten path, but when you're there, you're on the path. So it's nice, because the trees are right out front. And um, so we, as a, a family, bought the property. It was going to be developed into homes, and it would have been a shame, because it's been a farm for over 300 years. It's been an orchard for about 55, 60 years. And uh, so what happened was that uh, my son Nicholas, Nick Socrat, is the Farmer Nick, who people are getting to know as Farmer Nick. And he's a graduate of UMass Amherst, uh, Stockbridge Agriculture School. So he's been doing farming for about 15 years on different internships, the Native Community Organic Farm and up to New York. And so we said, hey, let's find a little piece of nothing, piece of land size of this room maybe or for him to play with. But, well, it ended up being this fell into our lap from Evan Chesborough, who said my good friend Bob Wormy, his wife is selling the farm. And it's better than when you bought the farm, that's not a good thing, but when you're selling the farm, that might be a good thing. So, so Nick is gonna go ahead and tell you about our shiitake mushrooms and how we actually produce them and he's gonna take, take over here. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Alrighty, so I'm here to walk you all through the steps from getting uh, from pretty much starting from nothing to mushrooms and uh, a little overview about mushrooms is they feed on dead material so we found a way to be able to take the spores of these mushrooms and grow them in sawdust blocks so this is how most of the mushrooms are produced now so they're um, inoculated into the sawdust so the mushroom itself is pretty much the tomato of the tomato vine. Um, the mycelium is like the vine of the tomato. So this is a fruit. This is only here to reproduce. So it comes out, it reproduces, it lets go of all the spores, and then, um, and then we eat it. So some of them are very poisonous. You know, you'll have five mushrooms that look the same. Two will make you sick, two are edible, and one can seriously damage your body. So that's the... Uh, it takes a lot of skill to really understand wow. mushroom harvesting. So we found a way to cultivate mushrooms in a very safe way. Um, and I will kind of go through the steps of doing that. Um, so the first step we take is um, I have a buddy who owns his own mushroom business. So he makes these, um, these blocks of sawdust and again, inoculates them, which, which means that you take the spores of the mushroom and you mix it with distilled water in a what's, syringe. What's spores? So spores are pretty much like a tomato seed. They're the little seeds oh, okay. of the mushroom. And what mushrooms do is, as they open, uh, we'll pass these mushrooms around, but um, this step, I don't know if you guys can see, they're very different. Whereas this mushroom is very open, this has already dropped all of its spores. This mushroom is kind of closed. So as mushrooms grow up, they start as a little ball, and they grow and then they open like an umbrella and they release all the spores and then the wind takes them away and they land on trees and then once they hit a tree they start growing like a web like a spider web and then they dig into the trees themselves and then from there they expand and they colonize the entire log or tree and then when you have a big rainfall that's when the mushrooms pop out so you'll see them pop out like this Arbor Nick, is that only on a decomposing tree, a tree that's dying? Is that what it has to be? Yes. So uh, if you see any trees with mushrooms on them, that tree will eventually die in 15 years. It's like a parasite. Wow. Um, mushrooms are amazing in that way is that once they find a weakness in a tree, they exploit it and they start taking over. And it's, you know, natural selection. Um, so from there, we have our inoculated blocks so as they as the spores start growing in here you take the syringe and you pretty much pour the spores into this sterile block of sawdust um, once you understand the full beginnings of how it works the rest of the steps will make more sense so all this white stuff we're going to pass this bag around if you guys want or i'll just uh, 
to be able to smell the mushrooms. It actually has a very distinctive smell. And I'll pass this table to table. And uh, if you guys want to just take a smell, and you could pass it around. Yep. Isn't that cool? Yeah. <laughs> um, that might take a while, but maybe we'll do this afterwards as well. But um, yeah, we'll take a break on this because that will take too long. But it will be here to smell because they have very distinctive smell, which is phenomenal. It smells like nature. Um, Can I ask a question? Has been sterilized prior to inoculation? Yes. We use a, um, uh, an autoclave. So once the bag is filled with sawdust, the sawdust has touched the ground. And any little contamination will actually, um, you guys can come see this afterwards, it will result in contamination, which is, a, a lot of it is penicillium, which is actually they make pen penicillin from. Uh, penicillin. I can't even say it right now. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, but it will, it's this green stuff on the side. And when you see that, that is a risk. And you kind of have to throw the bag away and start again. So from there, we go and we cut down healthy, but growing in the wrong place. We try to do this sustainably. We're not cutting down super healthy, big mother trees. We're cutting down little trees that are blocking other, you know, you kind of have to work with the environment. So we cut down oak and maple trees. Um, you can kind of tell this log right here has uh, a little bit of, it's already started to rot. So you can see the white clear wood that is uncontaminated. But right in the center, this tree is actually starting to die, um, which isn't a huge problem, but we ideally want really fresh logs. Now, is that fungus killing it? No, Don't so. Have, uh, why what, is there so much fungus on like trees now? Um, Rain, humidity. Well, there's a lot of different things. Uh, when people drive over trees with machines or they hit the side of them on the side of streets, um, any little scratch, there's actually um, a whole variety of trees or almost went extinct in, I think it was Yellowstone because the bears, uh, they kept clawing at the trees to like, you know, help their claws. But the mushrooms took advantage and they just started going all over the trees and contaminating them. And a lot of them started dying off within the next 10 years. So any little scratch on a tree can create a wound. And from that wound, then you have contamination. But so the best way to do it uh, is to start with a healthy tree. This one actually could have developed a root rot problem at the bottom. And then it starts in the core of the tree and works its way up and then it's contaminated. So from there, we have our, our log. Um, again, the size doesn't matter. You can do a little something like this which is easy to move around. Or I've done big ones, like 12 inch, 300 pound logs that I move with the tractor. So those ones have so many mushrooms on them and they can actually last for up to 10 years. So, and you can actually, I'll talk about this later, but you can flush them, which means the, the rainfall and the mushrooms will pop out. You can do that three times a year for up to 10 years. So once you do an inoculation, you'll have them for a long time. But a log like this may only last three years because it has a lot less uh, nutrients to offer the mushrooms and then once they um, use all the resources then the mushrooms they pass on so um, the next step once you have your log I picked this size I like it it's easy to work with um, we have to drill our holes so we're going to be taking that sawdust spawn which is already inoculated has all the little mycelium strands in it and they're ready to search for food so we're gonna put them into the log. But to do that, we have to drill holes in a diamond pattern. Um, I'm not, I actually pre-did this, because it's very loud and very dirty, but I just wanna turn on the drill once so you can kinda of hear the sound, um, kind of immerse you in the experience. And when, when we're doing this at the farm, it's very loud, but we have music playing. So it's a, it's a party, all my friends come, we drink some beer, we have a good time, and, uh, but you know, they end up missing a few holes here and there after the beer. Yeah. Um, so, as we go down, this is a determined depth. So they're all the same depth. Oh, uh, we got a special tool right on an angle grinder. These you can buy on uh, a certain website called Field and Stream, Amazon, wherever. Uh, but it just screws on here, predetermined length, and you're able to do, do it fast. So you go through and you make the holes pretty fast. So just the sound it makes. So it just kind of makes quite a mess, as you can imagine. So 
just wanted to show you that. So now that we have our logs drilled in a diamond pattern, two to three inches apart, and you guys can come see it later, uh, you can kind of see the holes. We take our plunger. So this plunger is identical to the depth of the bit. So you can kind of, uh, um, I'll just show you, it's kind of easier that way. So we take our plunger and we stick it into our substrate and now it's full. And then we go over to the holes and uh, just like that, wow. we fill them up. And uh, after I'm done talking, you guys can try it and we'll fill up this log and then, uh, yeah. And then it's kind of fun. It's, it's part of the experience. There's pretty much three steps. Drilling the holes, filling the holes, and the next step is waxing the holes. So once you have the mycelium in the holes, we talked about contamination. So other mushrooms can have spores that will land on this substrate, and if they're stronger and more vigorous, they will take over the log. And that's not what you want. You can see bright orange mushrooms. You can see really weird ones that are just popping up out everywhere, and you don't want that. So we take this wax. This is just regular food grade wax. You can use beeswax. Uh, this was the most available to me. It's pretty expensive, but it does the job. And that's why we have our little burner here. I was gonna burn, but it would definitely set off the, the fire alarm, so we don't want that. So we turn this on, heat up the wax to the point um, of where it's kind of bubbling. We want it so hot. And then we take my makeshift tool. They have ones that you can buy that are really expensive. Um, but I made this out of a cut paper towel. Not a paper towel, uh, like a tea cloth. And I folded it and put some uh, duct tape on it and I've used it for two years and it's been fine. <laughs> so we dip it in here and we just go over each hole and you wanna see a little sizzle. So you hear it go pss. And that means that it killed all the surface bacteria and spores on it. Now it's sealed, it is fully contaminant free and it would be just like this bag. Wow. And so the idea is you can actually, um, I'll talk about it after or soon, you can fruit mushrooms off of this, but you can also take this and put it into 20 logs. So now you're expanding your efforts by 20 times. So, and you get 20 times more produce as well. Uh, so a lot of businesses are using these in huge tractor trailers and you'll see hundreds and hundreds of these all stacked up next to each other and the mushrooms come right out, but we found a way to make it more worth our while. We buy four to five bags, and then we put them in about 60 to 80 logs. Um, so the next step, once we're all covered in wax, and it will look just like this. And again, you guys can come see this later. But this is all ready to go. All these holes are plugged. Um, if there's any massive damages and cuts, we put wax on it too. So the next step is we wait one year. We stack it in the woods, somewhere shady, um, and we let it sit. And what it's doing is it's colonizing. And every one of these little holes, as I said before, the spore kind of hits it and it turns into a spider web and it grows. So that's why you have the diamond pattern so they all touch each other and become one organism. Once it's one organism, it can't be contaminated because it's already, all the rooms are filled in the hotel. You know, wow. um, so. It's one unit, it's ready to go. Uh, this time of the year, you'll actually have a rainfall and the rain will just trigger the mushrooms to grow. But ideally, you wanna control when the mushrooms come out. So what we do is we'll take this log and we will soak it in water for 24 to 48 hours. And that simulates a really heavy rainfall. So this log just soaks up all the water because if you've ever felt a mushroom or if you've ever dehydrated a mushroom, these are about, I'd say 80% water. So the more water, the bigger the mushrooms. Um, so after you soak it, I take them out. And my little trick is I hit them as, as hard as I can with a sledgehammer. So that's, it's called, uh, you're pretty much simulating the tree falling. So the tree's falling and has a big smack and it wakes up the spores. They're ready. You know, it's time to fruit. The log is down. It's at the perfect level. So when the, uh, the wind blows the spores, it is able to cling to everything. So right from there, we set it up actually just like this on a stand and we wait within pretty much two days and you'll see little, little nodes coming out, little mushrooms, they look like little balls. And then you wait four more days, so pretty much take seven days and you will literally see mushrooms 
all over this, wow. all over the log. And then you go and you harvest them. And there's different progressions. So as I was saying before, this one is closed. So it's still kind of like a ball. A lot of people like it for uh, stir fries and it has a little bit more of a pungent taste. Or you can wait till they're really open. And I love this for soups because it's very uh, spongy. It really holds all the flavor. Um, and then from here, you can put them in a dehydrator and dry them for long-term storage. So you can always have an addition in soups. And actually, these are the most flavorful mushrooms because all the water's taken out. It's just the pure, nutty, wonderful shiitake flavor. And actually, these are the most popular way to eat them. So, um, let me see if I missed any steps here. On the logs, yes. you just poke uh, the, ho the holes on one exposed surface or cover the whole surface of? The whole surface, all the way around, the so way it's around. nice and even. Um, and if you're running low on spores, you can even go further apart. Or like on a bigger log, you can go closer together. It depends on how risky you're feeling. Um, but yeah, so that's the idea is it's fully covered. Do you have a certain area where you do this? Yes. So. The, the actual inoculation, we call it. This we do up at the garage, but then we bring them down. We have kind of an area near our swamp, and we put them under our conifer trees. So you want a bunch of pine needles, because when the pine needles fall, it makes the ground acidic. And when there's acidity, it's actually harder for other mushrooms to take hold. So it's kind of a little protection. Whereas if you have a bunch of deciduous leaves, like oaks and maples, uh, those collect spores and grow a lot faster. So you want the pine needles. And plus, you have all year coverage. Because if you have the sun beating down on these logs all the time, they're going to dry up, just like firewood. Um, and the little trick is to water them if they become, if it's like a drought. But you only have to you know, do it once or twice a year. You just take a hose and you water it, just to keep it from cracking. Because again, once you get a crack, contamination. Um, and you don't see that too often, especially last year when we had the most rain ever recorded. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, Excuse me, I missed the very beginning. Are these a certain kind of mushroom or all kinds of mushrooms that you do this? That's a great question. So we mainly do shiitake mushrooms. Okay. But you can also do oyster mushrooms, reishi, lion's mane, a whole bunch of different mushrooms that grow on the logs. Some mushrooms do only grow on manures. Some only grow on hay. But uh, a good few logs, I mean, a good few mushrooms will grow on these logs. Um, the, again, the best choice is oak and maple, but pretty much any hardwood would work. But the firmer the wood, the harder and the more packed the carbon is together, the, you know, the more surface area the plants or the mushrooms can kind of grow in. Do you have any other questions? Yeah, I don't like mushrooms. Is there anything I can use to get a better taste so I kind of like them? <laughs> um, I always find a little olive oil, salt, and pepper and getting them kind of crispy on the outside but chewy on the inside. Is it more of a texture you don't like? I just don't like the taste. Yeah. I don't know. There's a, there's a good few mushrooms out there. There's one variety. You just have to experiment. There's one called the, um, the king oyster mushroom. And it grows and it has a super thick stalk like this. And when you cut them open, uh, they look like scallops, and you can cook them the same way as a scallop. So if you like scallops, that's kind of that exact taste. Um, and it's kind of it really simulates the meat taste in a lot of people. It looks like been... she's not growing any mushrooms. No. <laughs> <laughs> the, the key is sauté. <coughs> that's the word. Butter. Oh yeah. Yes, you can, you absolutely. can make anything taste good. Yeah, they suck up the flavor of anything. So you can really put garlic powder and paprika and cayenne and get them really hot, and and it kind of completely changes the flavor. But it's tough. Can I tell you something? You know, you have a kid. I have three kids. But he amazes me. I gotta say, you know, you're a parent. You're all parents, probably, and stuff like that. Oh, he's but proud of you. It's not the I'm just, mushrooms. I'm it's just glad. Mushroom talk. It's a great talk. I mean, I. Jeez, I'm over here uh, learning something new. I know because I work with you, and but I learn more every time you talk about. I'm it. glad. And he's so passionate oh, about yeah. what he does. Like, well, awesome. there was just an article. If you go back and you can look, it was only out a few days ago. It was in the web, uh, the Worcester Gazette, Telegram Gazette. Oh, yeah. And there was an article. There's a big thing nationwide, a movement on young farmers. 
taking over for older farmers who were disenchanted or just need to retire or whatever. And there were four articles on four different farmers and the struggle for land, the struggle for finance. Nick's article was The Joy of Farming. That was the title of his article. Cool. Well, you gotta love it. You gotta love it. Yeah. You gotta love it. So he's turned this into Absolutely. part of our business at the farm. We do so many things, including concerts, and now the farmers mm -hmm. market's going to yeah. be yeah, there. Yeah, we just started doing concerts last yeah. year. Yeah, last year was great. We got 14 this year. Oh, every 14. single no, just depend on this. Every yeah. single Saturday at okay. six o'clock, six Super. to eight. We'll be there. It's either free or it's five dollars next right. year. Yeah. Get them all they can because next year we go to ten. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just we don't care about making money on these cars. We just don't want to lose on them. But anyway, yeah. so we're trying to be consistent. Like the mm -hmm. farmers market has come there now. We have Good. wheelchair accessible bathrooms. Wow. Okay. We have lots of parking, lots of parking unlimited. We have concessions. We have the store up there. The library is doing a happy hour. I'm not happy. Oh God. No. <laughs> they're doing a, they're doing a, a, considering. a reading blankets for little kids. So they have a couple blankets with celebrity readers and such like that, possibly. Oh, yeah. But every 10 o'clock. Every single Saturday morning during farmer's market, you can bring your grandchildren, your children, whatever, set them down and go shop. So we're trying to get 15, 16, 20 vendors over there and farmers and things like that. So we're trying to reboot it because it wasn't doing well here. But anyway, um, so also part of this industry that Nick has created at our farm, which is selling the mushrooms and the dehydrated ones, which will last in your cupboard. And you can just add them to your soups, your salads. And I guess if you add water, they just kind of absorb the water, water and they like a sponge, right? A couple more steps than that, but yeah. Anything. Yeah. When and, but you dehydrate we, them, Nick, yeah. after you rehydrate them, they still have the same flavor. They actually have a better flavor. Oh. Um, because, again, the most of the water is taken out and all the nutrients and, and everything the, condensed. Oh, okay. uh, but we also dehydrate at a temperature less than 118 degrees, which actually keeps all the nutrients. Oh in the food, which at the grocery store, they actually have to do it at a higher temperature because they don't know how long those are sitting right. on the shelves. Yeah. And same, we do like apple chips and kale chips, and it's just a way to get people who really don't like the, like just say the flavor of apples, but now it's covered in cinnamon and it's delicious, but it's yeah. still just the same amount of nutrition. So it's a little bit of research. I right, did. you know, I have heard kale chips, you put them in your oven and all, and put all the oil on it, but it's the same thing, but in the oven it's a much higher temperature, you kill the nutrients, whereas Nick just did a whole batch of kale chips in the dehydrator at 110? What yeah, did you 110. Do? Wow. 110. Now these logs also produced, um, you know, we have to, sustainability in a farm isn't just solar, it isn't just water, it isn't just recycling your manures and your earth and all that, it's also staying in business, you know, and, and the thing is that he created a little industry where we sell these because he does a mushroom expose, people come to the farm, they pay five dollars a piece for this, they come from all over, we get 50, 60 people. And we <laughs> sold, I think this year we sold 30 of these logs. Wow. Okay. Um, some of them were a little thicker and they're running 20 dollars a piece, but it was, it was, people just bought them. They bought them, they take them home, and then they can have their own mushrooms. So it's kind of cool. Man, you give it to you. When, when, the, when you buy them, they all filled up the holes. Yeah, they're all done. Like yeah. this one's all done. Oh, so wow. this one That's could go to your great. grandchildren as a gift or your son yeah. or whatever. Yeah. You can I have one available. So, but, <laughs> and this one's fifteen dollars. But, but the thing. idea behind what we do is, again, it's not just about the money. It's about education no. because. That's not what the dad says. The farming is dying. And you know, it's a human privilege to be able to grow plants, to be able to grow mushrooms. And the more I can get people excited in just one log at home, you know, that produces like a pound of mushrooms every time. Wow. And and you can flush it, you know, multiple times and even just learning about it, getting excited and then sharing it and then it's a ripple effect. The more people that understand and know and get excited, the better. Yeah. Because we shouldn't be relying on food from China when we have yeah. perfectly good soil right here. Right. You know, right. even hydroponics and stuff. I mean, grow outside while you can. There's no apocalypse. We can still breathe outside. I mean, it's, yeah. and there's, you know, there's a lot of land out there that can be used for this instead yeah. of being cleared for trees and, you know, buying some land and clearing all the soil out of it and selling it and then just leaving it barren. Yeah. I mean, that's not sustainable. That's selfish. But yeah. it's just, yeah. I don't know. No. The more people that love farming, yeah. the better. Because yeah. you can start from nothing. One little spore. Put it in this, it inoculates it, and then you put it in 20 different yeah. logs. I mean, it's a way to expand a way you get food. Yeah. So. so 
Yeah. Thank you. But, thank you. So, yeah. how exactly do you get to your place from here? Well, as you might have seen, the new beautiful signs. signs. I, I did see the signs. signs. There's ones yeah. at the congregation, really? second congregation. I want to thank them for working with yeah. us. We had to go through the police chief, the fire chief, DPW, town engineer, congregational church, and then we had to apply, a selectman. Mm -hmm. Approved it, and then we had to get building permits for the two signs to put on. Wow. So, but it's a privilege to be on public land. Yeah, that was a good thing. Yeah. And they're beautiful. And a lady came this morning. We were closed, but we were getting ready. And she said, "I saw your sign. I had to come down. I see this beautiful sign." So she came, and that was great. Mm -hmm. um, so, how do you get here? Go down Martin Road. Yeah, and you'll see little signs about this big with the rooster is our logo. Okay, so just sign, follow those. But... Or Southeast Maine. To go down there where the cemetery is, yeah. there's another one of those big, beautiful wood right. signs there. You can go right down Southeast Main, follow the signs, and it's on Locust Street. Oh. So it's it's a mile and a half from here, if that. So wow. if you're in your car, oh, you're there in lost. three and a half minutes. Wow. You won't get lost. Take a ride at you. <laughs> well, I might get lost coming back. <laughs> yeah, well. It's an adventure to get there once you're there. It's the peace and tranquility. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Whenever we're open, you're welcome to bring your grandchildren, your children, whatever. The farm is... Free for everybody to walk around. You don't have to buy anything. You can bring a picnic. You can sit there. You can do you whatever. Still have apples. Huh? You still have apples in the fall? Yeah, so we had our first apple festival this past fall, and we were just walking around, and we did see flowers. Yeah, we should. So, so we had a flowers. huge crop last year, and a lot of my teachers were saying that your trees are biennial, so you won't have any next year. But we mm. actually do have quite a few oh, apples, that's good. and our blueberries look incredible as well. Oh, I think of, Vegas had sports betting whether we could restore this orchard or not, and, uh, and Vegas lost. Can you just come so by we did pretty the blueberries? Good. You don't have to pick them yourself. We do do a lot of, uh, we'll pick in advance, so mm -hmm. we'll have some ready. Uh, we usually, um, yeah, we'll have pints ready. Okay. But then we also have to, you know, pick your own. Right, so we, when you pick your own, it's a pound. <coughs> we have their pints, so they're two-thirds of a pound. But we I know my friend them. likes to go pick her own. Oh, my goodness, what a great time. And especially, you know, during genius. the concerts. <laughs> yeah. The, the performers are saying, where's everybody? It was 120 <laughs> people here, but there's only 50 out here now, or 40, because they're out there picking blueberries. They're taking their kids to see all our, you know, the piglets yeah. and the lambs and, you know, going around the farm. There's no, it's not like you're at Indian Ranch and you're sitting in a seat and you're stuck. You know, when you're at a farm, it's chill. Wow, that's great. You come up to the window, you get ice cream, you get whatever you want, you walk around, come in the store. So today I did bring a little bit of our store here. So yeah. I have some eggs, duck eggs, chicken eggs, we have honey, um, all natural soaps and, and, and bee, uh, lip balms, and we have, of course, Nick has provided, provided the shiitake mushrooms all dried, you know, so um, certainly, and we have cards up here and some other things to hand out as well. And honey candy, that's liquid filled honey. Oh. Not ours, I mean, it's ours, we sell it, but yeah. it's not our honey. This is our honey, this is from, we have hives, and Ken Warchel from Northbridge does our honey. So. Wow. So we no mushrooms in there. Huh? No, much. <laughs> no. <laughs> We have some free soap samples. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I guess we can... Maybe that I would like it. I'll cook you mushrooms someday. Oh, yes, okay. So thank you, Nick. Thank you, Carmen, Nick. I have a question. I, have a question. I actually have a question. So, Leave that up there. do you have to pick your mushrooms at a certain time and then, or oh, they could go bad, or... Yes, so again, there's the, the multiple stages. Right. So as they grow up, if you want them super dense, you start here. But again, once they open, you when they're all the way open, you have about three to four days to pick them because the, there's slugs that love them. There's little right. mites that go underneath, but you can wash them off. Um, the, also, deer like the mushrooms, so we have to put a fence around them. Yeah. But then just nature. Again, if it rains a lot, um, the mushrooms can go two ways. They can either get super wet and decompose on the log, or they get super dry. Um, so you hope for the dry, because if they're dry, you can use them. But if they become so wet, they decompose, and they're, you know, you can put them in soup and stuff, but they still they get kind of gross. Uh, so again, once you soak the logs, you have, let's just say, two weeks to pick them. Wow. Yeah. Um, but we can turn this into a show and tell, and I can show you guys uh, the contaminated Mushrooms yeah, and then like any that. questions and kind of cycle through if you guys want and any questions please ask because that's the goal. So. Yeah, it must awesome. take a long time to get everything ready on this on the log, so doesn't it? Oh yeah, I mean that's why it's nice usually to have like friends and, yeah. and family come and help and uh, kind of make a party out of it. It always helps. And if you're doing a lot of logs, 
Uh, this year I did most of them myself because I wanted them to be perfect, especially the ones I sell because, again, my friends miss holes here we'll and there. stop giving um, them beer till after. Yeah, <laughs> they won't work without the beer. you got to fuel them. You say, do your job, then you get the beer. Yeah, most of them are arborists, and you know, those guys. Nick, do you stack the logs or yes. do you just lay them out on the ground? Yeah, so we, um, we use pout, a pout system. So we have pouts, and then we stack them you know, vertically and then horizontally, and then we make it about this high. Mm -hmm. um, that way we can either lift the whole pallet with the tractor, or when I get my forks under it, I just kind of roll them on. Yeah. Especially when they're 12 inches and 300 pounds, mm -hmm. it gets kind of a lot to move with. That's a great question. Keeping them up off the ground is key because ground contact, immediate contamination. Because if you've ever put a pallet or wood on the ground and you turned it around, you had to see all that white? That's other mushrooms growing right on it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, but again, nature's amazing. You put one piece of wood on the ground for one week and it starts to, the ground starts to eat it. You know, and without the mushrooms, the same with vultures. You know, vultures, they come and they eat the roadkill and they get it out of our system. And same with the mushrooms. Because could you imagine all the brush in the woods without it being decomposed and it would just be sticks piled yeah. a foot tall? Kind of hard to walk through the woods. But. Um, so yeah, you guys can come on up and any questions, please.